that going. Okay, I'm going to get started. I've got a couple of staff that are on the call. So if there's any problem uh, hearing me, you guys let me know. I think we're all good to go. Let me go ahead and get my screen going for you all. All right, let me share that. Well, thank you everybody for joining us today. Um, my name is Natalie Roy. I'm the executive director of AgriSafe. And I'm gonna be talking to you a little bit about launching the AgriStress helpline in your state. And the reason why we decided to hold this is because um, we had a couple of weeks ago, we had an NPR story that was released with an interview with Scott Simon. It was the weekend edition. And Scott Simon had interviewed a couple of our staff, Linda Manuel and Tara Haskins, about the AgriStress Helpline. And after that interview aired, um, we had uh, really a great uh, response from states, people across the, the country who were very interested in how to implement the AgriStress Helpline in their state. And maybe that for several of you, we already talked with you about um, that idea, or maybe you even have the helpline in your state right now and wanting to learn more. So um, we thought this would be a really easy way in the 30 minutes we have together to uh, just catch people up to speed and how the helpline works and make sure to answer some questions and certainly give people an opportunity to follow up later with um, specific information about their interest. So just to go ahead and proceed, if you don't aren't familiar with AgriSafe, I um, want to let you know that we are a national nonprofit and our tagline is protecting the people who feed the world. And we do this in many different ways. We are a small organization, but we have a wonderful reach because of partnerships that we have. And um, we, those are partnerships with academic institutions, government agencies, uh, in this particular case with the Helpline, State Departments of Ag. Um, and we feel it's important that we, have, that we look at serving the population that works so hard um, to feed the world. And so we, we really look at Emerging issues is important to AgriSafe, especially if they fall into the public health area. So you'll see we'll do quite a bit on um, areas of emerging issues like the opioid epidemic, um, looking at how floods might impact farms in a way that's different than if you're born on a farm. And with a real focus on that public health side, we want to train doctors and nurses and other health professionals in rural America to care for farmers. So you'll see a lot of our initiatives have a strong clinical focus. And certainly we want to make sure that mental health professionals understand the risk in ag as well. So you see quite a work on the mental health side. Uh, innovations are important and the cornerstone of what we do. And so when we see opportunities uh, to advance our public health programming, we're going to really look at innovative solutions to make that happen. I feel that AgriStress Helpline is a great example of that innovation. So a little bit again about what you're going to learn today. Um, you're going to learn about how the AgriStress Helpline is an innovative crisis model, model and how it serves a critical unmet need. Why do we even have this line in place? You're gonna learn more about how the fee structure is determined, um, how to prepare for a 30 day launch, if you're interested in that, and how the partnerships are structured to be customized and to meet the unique needs of ag producers in each state. First of all, let's talk a little bit about why do agricultural uh, folks at ag need the help line. Why is that important? Well, there's no question that farmers face a lot of stressors in the work they do, and a lot of these stressors are outside of their control. For example, they've got changes in weather, droughts. We know that the flooding in Florida is an example of devastation from a natural disaster. They may have limited access to health services. Um, fluctuating commodity prices certainly bring in stressors. Just even with what happened with the COVID, um, where we saw dairy farmers that were dumping their milk because they couldn't bring their milk to processing. That changes the whole structure of that dairy farm and their ability to keep the farm going. And so unfortunately, um, as, as much as farmers work really hard to predict um, these risks, there are times that the, the um, changes in the market 
can really sink a, a farm. And so financial reasons are a big, big stressor for farmers. And those of you that work in agriculture or work with folks in ag production know firsthand a lot of those stressors that farmers deal with. And we don't, we, we find that farmers are, um, they work the hours that they work or outside of the normal nine to five. And oftentimes health professionals and mental health professionals may not understand these stressors. So they don't always connect well with people who work in agriculture. The health professionals have a disconnect. And so uh, we felt here at AgriSafe, and we've been looking at this model for several years, that farmers deserved access to their own 24-7 crisis line. That, that it wasn't okay to say, um, call the state line and talk to someone on the other end that might know ag. We want to make sure that when they call ag, call the help line, they're talking to someone who understands agriculture. So this, these are the states that we started with in terms of this help line, the pilot states. Um, we've got Connecticut is going to be adding on to that this list soon. And uh, this were the original states that started with us uh, about a year ago. And you can see from, from this example that um, it also, the helpline that we've created is not just a call line, but it's also has a te text feature, which is really important, especially for the younger generation. This is just an example of how um, the helpline is communicated within a particular state. And I'm just sharing this with you because uh, states that come on board with us, every new state that comes on board will work closely with them to make sure that um, they get this information so they can push it out. And the states that are under this pilot initiative um, have all also invested dollars into marketing. So they'll work closely with other universities in the state, or it could be the Farm Bureau. So every state that has the helpline, which are the five um, that I showed you here a minute ago, these five, they all have really unique relationships with other organizations in the state. So AgriSafe provides the helpline. We work closely with helping to market and promote the helpline. We also are in charge of the training of the crisis responders. But um, the, the actual marketing and promotion, there's a lot of great um, uh, best practices that are happening, you know, uh, even today in terms of promoting the line. For example, one state has a, a billboard uh, that they're going to be putting up in their state, and that's actually funded through funding that came through Farm Bureau for that state. So we're really um, able to test out different methods to promote the line. Um, so this is an example of what, of what that would look like for a particular state. Um, in terms of um, best practices, I want to just emphasize, you know, we've had a training or a webinar about a month ago on how the line was built. Like, who's behind it? What are the quality? What's the quality aspects of the line? And so I encourage you to check that out. And I'll go ahead and show you where you can listen to that webinar because I I know a lot of you may be on this session because you're really wanting to like do a deep study and say, okay, well, what, what makes this line unique? How do I know it's a quality line? Um, but even though we did a separate um, information session on that on July 19th, I, I want to just emphasize a few important points because what we've learned over the years is that a hotline is not a hotline is not a hotline. And what I mean by that is that um, we first have to ask ourselves the question, are we offering a true crisis line for farmers or is it a line for, for information and referral, which is absolutely important. And we know that farmers need access to good information. But if to be a crisis line, there are standards you have to follow because if somebody is at risk for suicide, you cannot have somebody answering that line that is not prepared and trained to handle that. And so when we design this crisis line, uh, again, we designed it several years ago, even though it, it launched with these states um, last year. When we were designing this and spending time researching this, we said, first off, what we have to do at the end of the day is we've got to be able to be a safety net and be a lifeline first. And what I mean by that is that if a farmer calls the Agri-Stress Helpline, they are not, and they're in, in crisis and risk for suicide, they are not told to hang up and call 988 or warm transfer to 988. The people answering the line are also the folks that also answer for 988. Okay, so they're, they're credentialed by the American Association of Suicidology and the National Suicide Prevention Helpline. Um, and that was so important to us because we don't know at any point in time when a, when a producer calls that helpline, we never wanna say, no, we can't help you call 988. These are specialists that are trained 
and they understand what their job is. And their job is to really de-escalate someone in crisis. That's the first job right off the bat. Their job is not to throw a bunch of resources at folks and say, hey, you can have help here or there. They've got to meet that person where they're at and they have to have training and empathy and actually meet standards of compassion and empathy to even be able to answer the line. So I'm really proud of the fact that, that the people that are answering this line, they have that background, but they also have background in something called farm response, which is a unique training I'll mention here in a little bit. Um, but I want to just set the stage for folks to understand that absolutely you can say this is a lifeline first for the farm before it's anything else. And we have to do that part right. This is the organization via link that we work with. Um, that's actually the, the organization that we're subawarding some of the funds to that they're actually handling the line. So AgriSafe did not set up a call center where we have AgriSafe employees answering it. We knew that Bailey is a leader in the nonprofit sector with crisis line response, and we knew we had to work together. It wasn't going to be good enough for AgriSafe to figure this out. We had to work with a leader in this space. And we found Via Link to be the best leader, and they've been amazing to work with. You can learn a lot more about them by listening to that other webinar I mentioned. Um, so they've customized this line with us. Um, and so the relationship between Via Link and AgriSafe and the states that have the line is very tight, and the information flows in many directions. This is an example of um, the call flow. I'm just going to check, make sure everybody's good here for a second. All right, you all can see that slide, right? I see, you're good, okay. I wanna make sure sometimes my slides don't advance. Um, this helpline call flow is important for you to see just so that you understand that there's, there's clear flow of information. And you can see, as I mentioned before, um, we're gonna assess for suicide risk first. It's absolutely critical before we move into other um, resource support structures. Okay, a lot of, another question that I just want to bring attention to folks because I know that many of you are trying to think about, okay, well, you want to support 988 in your state, you don't want to detract from that, um, but you want to say, well, how does this compete or not compete or complement? Um, I wanted to let everybody know that AgriSafe is in close connection with Vibrant. And Vibrant is the nonprofit that received the funding um, for 988. They were the ones that received Lifeline dollars before. Um, as you all know, that that line was a 10 digit number now went to 988, which is so, so critical. And we think that's a wonderful advancement. Uh, this line is, is similar in that if you farmer calls 988, they're going to get um, crisis response from people who are qualified uh, to, to serve their needs. If they call the helpline, it's the same exact thing. The people that are answering the helpline, as I mentioned earlier, are also trained and also answer for 988. The reason why this is a unique number and we don't promote the helpline, AgriStress helpline number with 988 is we don't want to confuse a consumer because um, they're going to get cared for if they call the helpline number, the AgriStress helpline number. But we also know that our helpline number has people who are trained in agriculture. That's the difference. Um, while we can train state-based 988 providers to, to understand the competency issues and understand the stressors and add. The problem is with that is that the way the 988 system is set up, there's no guarantee that the 988 call center answering that call to a particular state is gonna have people that are trained in agriculture. So we've worked really hard with the national lifeline provider, Vibrant, to, to think about how to best serve the farm population and the way that we determine is we've got to have a specific line for farmers. There's no way around it. 988 also could not set up um, a queue where you say you call 988. If you're a farmer, you press two. If you're a veteran, you press three. If you're a health professional, press four. That's not allowed in the 988 system because what you don't want to do in someone in crisis, you don't want to put them in, in a queue where they're having to listen to all those prompts because it could be very dangerous for someone in crisis. So I, I want everyone to know that the way that we're trying to work really hard with 988 in the states is encourage warm transfer. So what that means is that if a call comes in through 988 for, let's say, Texas, where we have the helpline, we want the 988 provider has to do their job to, to service that call. But if they determine that they're a farmer and they're 
they're not in crisis, but they could use some further assistance to go ahead and do a warm transfer to the helpline. So we're really working closely with 98s in the states to make this happen. Um, as I mentioned, I mentioned quite a bit about what the training that our specialists have training. The training is called Farm Response. It's a three and a half hour course. You can learn more about it on our website. The reason why I show you this map is to show you all the states that have invested in it. And what's happening is as, as the health lines are rolling out in state, all the states that have uh, the helpline also are training folks in farm response. So the, the goal is a year from now that when the calls start coming in through, when calls come in through the helpline, that we can refer people to farm response trained professionals. So you can see why these states have invested in both the helpline and farm response at the same time is because we want to be able to have that referral network to refer folks to mental health professionals. Also, as I said, this farm response training is the base training of anybody answers for our helpline. So the call specialists have to have training in this, and they also have to have continuing training that's offered through AgriSafe. Um, I know I don't have a lot of time with folks here because I wanted to keep to 30 minutes. So I want to kind of jump into some of the nuts and bolts of like how the line works, what a relationship with us would look like. Um, so I'm going to move away from the issue of the best practices to get into like who owns the line, why the number is the same number, so I can help people understand that. And certainly as you're thinking about questions, go ahead and put them in the um, either through chat or the question box. I don't know if I have a question box in this one, but the chat is perfectly fine. Um, okay, so let's talk a little bit about intellectual property. So when I say intellectual property, what I mean is who owns what and who, at the end of the day, if, if let's say you were in business with AgriSafe to say, okay, we want AgriSafe to, to run the helpline, what you can expect in terms of ownership. First of all, the helpline is the same number shared among all of the states in which we operate the helpline. And there was a reason why we designed it that way. We anticipate with the level of interest and the need for this helpline, that this will roll out to be a national line. And our goal is to get this to a national scale in 12 to 18 months. It's gonna take a lot of work because we have to get funders on board to stand behind the helpline and say, you know what? State boundaries shouldn't matter. Farmers deserve access to a 24 seven crisis response line, no matter what state they're in. And frankly, having only it in certain states is a difficult thing because really what happens is, is that from a marketing and a promotion standpoint, it's very hard to say, well, if you're in one of the five states call, but if you're not in the five states, we don't want you to call. That's not what AgriSafe is about. We want farmers to be served. We want them to get the help they need and we want to save lives. That's what this helpline is intended to do, is to save lives first. So it is an important goal at AgriSafe to have this line be national. The five states on board with us are really our pilot states that are working closely to make this reality in their state. Um, but again, they all carry the same exact name for the helpline and the same number. And that's done on purpose because we don't want them to have to send out a num number later when the line goes national. So you can see the transition will be seamless because they've already invested in the name, they've already communicated the name and the number. And that is why we have said any new states that have come on, some have said, or not new states, but folks that have expressed interest, we said, you can't call them to help find something else and we're not gonna procure a different number. You can get another number, but the number, if you wanna do business with AgriSafe and have this helpline in your state, you're gonna to have to carry the name and the number that that is consistent throughout. Um, the other thing that I just want to emphasize too, before I forget to tell you, is that because it's a crisis line, we have to answer a call from anybody that calls from any state. And so right now we're fielding calls from other states because people are finding the number. Um, we can't, the reason why we can't, if someone from California calls, which we don't have a, a contract with, the, with in California, we can't say, well, okay, you're from California. We can't help you. Let you know you need to call 988. No, if somebody is in crisis, we have a responsibility to service them. So while we don't have financial support to handle that call from California, it's our duty to handle that call from California. 
So right now, AgriSafe is kind of in a, in, a, in a sticky situation because while we don't have funding to support calls from outside of the five states, we're going to answer them anyways. That's why we've asked partners to be mindful about not pushing the number in the states that we don't have through funding for in those states because it places a burden on the whole system. But you can see why it makes no sense to keep it just on a state by state. We really need to go national with this line. The other thing that, um, that I wanted to mention was that if services were to terminate, if you were to have the helpline with us, if you were to terminate that relationship, let's say after the year, um, you don't have ownership of the, of the name or the other number. And again, it's for the reason that, that we're trying to protect that um, for a national scale up. As per, in terms of launch information, um, just let you know, we're looking at a helpline launch of 30 to 45 days after contract. Now, this says 30 days. We've had such a tremendous response from folks um, after that the interview that it may take a little bit longer, but 30 days is a pretty good estimate. And the reason why we can move, move so quickly on this is because, again, we're working with a nonprofit provider via link who's trained in this, and we've already prepared all the steps in order to get ready for a 30-day launch. That's been very attractive to a lot of the states that have come to us because they know with their funding, and, and all this funding so far has come from State Department of Ag funding, they know they that that they can't waste time. They've got to invest in the farmer. They've got to invest those dollars that they received into a true service. Um, and so that's why you see the 30-day launch is, is, is so tight. So basically, uh, we received notice last October that the five states had funding. By February 1st, it was ready to go. And states were to be able to come on board uh, after that on a quicker pace of 30 days because we had already set up all the protocols. Um, logo, for example, you know, we asked folks not to push out the name and number until that 30 day mark because we need to make sure we get ready and have all the information. And what I mean by information is we're sourcing information. So if a farmer calls in a new state, let's say Montana comes on board, we want to have all the information about resources on Montana ready to go. So when they call in, the call specialist can pull that database up and know what to recommend. That includes the 911 dispatch information. So that's why you see there's a hole there in terms of um, not promoting it. And then I also want to just emphasize too, the crisis text line is the same number as the phone number. So that's a really important piece too, because um, the texting, texting aspect is a great um, benefit of the program. Okay, let's get into the fee structure. I know I've only got a few minutes left of our 30 minutes. So what does it cost to run this program? So states with less than 50,000 ag producers will pay $50,000. Okay, it doesn't matter if you if you come to ag or say, I've got 20,000 uh, farmers. What's That's the base minimum. And the reason why there's a base minimum is that there's a tremendous amount of work across all the states to establish this line. Um, and, and it comes into things such as the training of the professionals answering it, sourcing information. So just because a state may have less producers doesn't mean that there's less work in terms of understanding the resources in those states and making sure that that call line is effective and really tapping into that network in the state. So you're going to see a base rate if, you're, if you fall under the 50,000 ag producers. States over 50,000 ag producers the cost is going to be one one dollar per producer per year. So if you have a hundred thousand ag producers in your state, the cost per year, the total cost per year is going to be a hundred thousand dollars. Okay, so that gives you an idea. This is based on on estimates of, of percentages of calls coming in, and certainly this is for first year. Certainly, we want to see the volume go up over over the years. So you're going to see that. That rate potentially change as volume goes up, um, but this is this is what the rate is for the first year. In terms of media, there may be some of you here that are are here representing media, wanting to write about it. Um, that's been a really really big um, interest in folks in trying to communicate what this line is about. I'm just sharing you with you who that person is, is Laura Siegel. So please make sure to reach out to her. Um, the other thing I want to um, I'm gonna take questions too in a minute, but I wanna share with you, if you're interested in more information, like, okay, what's next? 
go ahead and um, you can scan this with your phone um, while you're listening and go ahead and, and send us something through this intake form. Um, it's a brief intake form. The reason why we set it up this way is because um, sometimes the interest comes in through info at AgriSafe. Sometimes I get it. We want to be really mindful of what people are interested in. And we're happy to set up a separate meeting with you. Um, and it doesn't matter like if you're just sort of interested in it and you don't have dollars to come forward, but you want to know how to implement some of this in your state. We want to help be thought leaders with you on this um, because it may be something that you might project, you know, for the future, maybe next year, this time there might be availability to do it. Or maybe you want to talk a little bit more about what a national rollout looks like. So feel free to um, to, to connect with us here. So, so maybe it seems sort of like contradictory if I'm saying, well, we can add more states, but we want to do national. Just to let you know what that looks like is that we believe that um, there's going to be enough work for the states to promote the line. So our goal is to raise enough funds for a national line that isn't a burden for the state where the states have to buy into that national line. Okay, so we're, so what our goal is is to is to find the funds to fund a national line with the idea that the state's contribution will come in the form of promoting promoting it. But we want the actual operation of the line to be funded because it gets too sticky to say, okay, well, we've got state funding from half the states, and the other ones we don't, who gets the service? So we feel like there's been enough interest in this and the quality of this line that we think we can find um, national partners that will say, "Yep, yeah, we're going to fund this because we believe this is the right thing to do. And we'll be part of a part of a, um, a coalition that's going to stand behind this as a national line. So um, happy to talk more about that uh, in terms of strategy. But again, um, this is a this is a start in terms of getting these states on board. Let's see. So I'm just going to look and see if there's any questions. And, and I have some staff that are here on with me. So Tara Haskins, she's she's on board there, and she uh, she was the one that that has been actively involved in the design of this. And I think we might have some folks from VLink. But Tara, is there anything that I might have might have missed? Um, uh, no, um, I've answered a few questions in the chat as they've come up. Um, so um, feel free. If there are any other questions about any other details of the line, I'll be glad to talk about that. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and jump to our website too, just in case people don't know where there's lots of other information. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. Are there any other Tara? Are there any other questions that might have come through that? Um, I should address to everybody or uh, we just we uh, one that has not been addressed yet is um, by Jen Siemens um, um, asking about what if anything is being done in terms of a pipeline to train and staff the helpline with former um, former farm workers and especially native speakers of indigenous languages. Um, we I will say Jen that you know we've had individuals reach out to us that have you know, want to participate in the helpline. Um, we funnel those requests or those uh, inquiries to VLink because they, number one, have to meet the standards that that VLink meets because this is a crisis line first and to talk to them about what availability they have on that staff. Um, uh, they are certainly open to, you know, the diversity of individuals that can work on the line. Um, so I don't know if you have anything else to add to that, Natalie. And yeah, I'm so I'm so glad that, that got, <laughs> yeah, I'm so glad that got brought up. So when you think about like where we are in this phase of the helpline, um, this is the infancy stage. We launched it in February. We know that there are unique populations that don't know it exists. It's not been you know a lot of promotion materials aren't translated in language that. That, it, that matches those cultures. And so what we have to be uh, really mindful at is that we don't, we want this line to not, to be able to, to relate to folks all over the nation. First, obviously with the states we're working on. And so we would definitely welcome any partners and even helping us with the training of the call specialists. And that's, that's why we 
partnered with this, this center that we've chosen is because they're always in this in the search for learning. So they understand that even that three and a half hour course they took on farm response isn't going to be enough to uh, answer the calls from, from groups that we hope will call in the future. And so there's absolutely development um, milestones in place, but we are looking for unique partners to help us in the continued training. And look, if you look at the agriculture, there's everything from folks that are header, you know, working heterites to other populations that, you know, like for example, I'm here in Louisiana and there's a strong um, Vietnamese uh, uh, fishermen that do both, you know, they raise rice, but also the crawfish. And so is a helpline really going to help them right now? No, because we haven't done true outreach to these unique population. And, and there's a lot of work to do. So ab absolutely, we want to um, connect in that way and, and, and improve. So please reach out to us if you can offer anything. I think once we have the helpline also on a national scale, it's going to be um, it's going to be easier to really continue to develop different modules within the line in terms of the training because we'll have that investment on a national scale. Let's see. Um, did you get the one from Christine Young, Tara? Just want to make sure. Um, works with Margaret. Let's see. Yes, anybody? Um, so, for sure, the line of the, I mean, we, anybody who works in agriculture, again, no one's going to get turned away. So we'd rather have you recommend the line. So farm workers, absolutely. It, we do have the um, language capability for translation. So there's not a problem with, um, with that service. We've told folks not to worry so much about like, you know, for example, if you're, if you're worried about your child or an uncle or a friend, you can even call on their behalf. So there isn't any, any reason for folks need to feel the line is not for them. We would, because the line gets answered, no matter what, um, you're very safe in pushing it out. What we ask that you do is, is not promote it outside the five states that have that we have the line, um, just because it, it would, again, it places a burden on the call center. So if you're, if you're promoting it within, um, you're promoting it within the five states, and again, Connecticut coming on soon, then that's great. And if we get calls from other states, we get calls from other states, we'll answer those. Um, there was a question about usage of line. Um, we're seeing about a 10% increase of the lines overall by the states, and there's some fluctuation. So we're, it's too early on for to give actual numbers, but um, because it's there's quite a variation in the states, some of the states, depending on how it's promoted, we're getting a lot of calls um, that aren't even, that aren't farmers because the line is getting picked up and shared. And again, um, that's okay, but it is aimed for that population. Let's see, what about background for veteran farmers? Great, great question on that. So this is another example, we, because there's a veteran line that's unique to 988, our 988, our, our call center provider, VLA, is very much in tune with what's available for veterans. So, so they're able to go ahead and make appropriate referrals for veteran farmers because they also are part of the whole nationwide uh, lifeline. Uh, I think that, I wanna see if there's anything else in here. And also Natalie, I included that um, the farm response training and any quarterly trainings, uh, that farm response has information on veteran farmers and they have additional optional trainings in their learning lab platform that are specifically a couple of webinars about veteran farmers to help them with that population to understand that better. Mm -hmm. And and certainly, you know, at AgriSafe, we never see our jobs being done. Like we've, you know, we've invested in understanding the needs of veteran farmers. Um, certainly, we're going to continue the great relationship with VLink and the states is that as information comes in, it there's never a, a situation where someone says, well, we don't want, we don't have time to hear about what they're going through. Case in point, um, in Texas, there were there was quite a bit of calls coming in from farmers. They were worried about labor shortages. And it was, there was a high amount of stress with that. We we found that out from the call center, notified us. We then contacted Texas Department of Agriculture. They searched for appropriate resources and made sure that information came back to the call specialist. So 
there's going to be times that um, we're continuing to improve the content based on what we're hearing from farmers calling. And so that relationship is very important. It's not a one-way communication. So it's not a matter of AgriSafe saying to the call specialist, okay, uh, we need you to know all this information. If the call specialists are hearing things from the calls that they're not trained on, they're going to come back and say to us, look, we need more information about labor shortages, you know, uh, what, what's available there. So I can't tell, I can't emphasize enough how much this relationship between the call specialist, AgriSafe, and the states who we're working with is a very customized approach. And our goal is to be as responsive as possible. Uh, I know we're over the half an hour time period. I think I think we've got most of the questions answered. Because they're in the chat box, everybody should be able to see all of um, Kara's answers here. Um, I I also want to just kind of close with just, just to let you all know that uh, AgriSafe stepped forward to do this work because, uh, frankly, the work wasn't being done. And we did not see, well, there was a lot of money and effort put into uh, the ideas of hotlines, but uh, we believe that farmers needed to have a crisis line first, that that needed to be offered. And we believe that a crisis line combined with resource line was really the best approach. Um, and we invested into this, this design years ago before the funding came, came about uh, last year. And I'm also proud about the fact that, that Dr. Tara Haskins, who, who is here with me, you know, she is full-time in the mental health space, background in mental health. So um, really working hard to be thought leaders in this, but would love to hear from folks who have visions of how this helpline could help them in their state um, or among unique populations that we should be serving. So please don't hesitate to reach out, reach out to us. Is there any, any other questions? I think we're good. Oh, I wanted to show you all real quick. Um, I'm sharing the right screen. Check out our website for information. Uh, you're going to see information about that webinar um, on the left side. That's a really great, that was done July 19th, a really great deep dive on like how it was designed. We're very specifics about what the crisis specialists do in their, in their job. Um, and then as you look through this, this page, I would love for folks to think about um, looking at how to get involved. What we're really excited about is that after, since that interview that was done with, with NPR, we've had such a flood of folks that have contacted us and said they want to help, they want to volunteer to staff the line. And what we realized from this is that there's an outpouring of interest to be of service to the farmer and so and to the producer. So um, we developed marketing resources that um, folks can literally download just by coming here to our website and if you can push forward the, the information in your state where the helpline is available, that would be excellent. Um, so with that, I think we'll let you all go. And thanks so much for all your time today. Have a great rest of the day.